I shall see the King when the angels sing. I shall see the King someday in the better land on the golden strand, and with Him shall ever stay. In His glory, I shall see the King and forever.
speaking today, going afar, upon the mountain, bringing the wondrous back again, into the fall of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb. Heavenly Father, we're happy to be here before you this morning. We thank you to be your sons and daughters, seeking your healing by your touch us today. Forgive our sins and mistakes, dear Lord, we've done through the week and every day. We're seeking your support and encouragement in our walk, in our journey to seek the grace of Jesus Christ to die for us. Dear Lord, we always mess up in our words, in our actions, in our moods, in our look. But for you, you accept us as we are, and you can tap in our hearts, really teach us to be humble, to be kind, to be helpful, to support each other. Dear Lord, we used to use our word to be soothing in our family members, our friends, our neighbor, that they can know that cross you are in us, you guarding our journey, heading you home, where you prepare a place for us. We can't do it without your guidance, your help. Whatever we do, we mess up. So this morning, we surrender ourselves to you. Touch our minds, touch our bodies, touch our souls, that you can hear us today and every day to know we belong to you. Teach us to be good ambassadors for the good news because a lot of our friends, our family members, our neighbors don't know you yet. So use us to be ambassadors, wherever we are, whatever we do, to be used as your servants. This morning, dear Lord, remember those people here in the church this morning who are struggling with life, probably some have issues with relationship or finance or other things, dear Lord. We ask that you can touch those people who are having that rough time to know that you are with them today. To 
teach them to seek your help, to give us them, to give themselves to you, that you can guard and help people to work the issues out. This morning also we put your servant, Gerald, as you open the word to touch us, to help us, to build us, so we can continue to journey heading home where you prepare a place for us. Dear Lord, this world is aging, it's messy. Now we are just happy to have a hope and look forward for that day where you will take us home, where there will be no sickness, no pain, no other things we're suffering today. Bless us everyone here this morning to have that hope and look forward, rejoicing that soon you come, you will come take us home, we will be with you forever. Now we surrender ourselves this morning to you. Give our minds, our bodies, our hearts to be in your care, to continue to teach us to be humble, kind, and all to surrender in Jesus' hand. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids. Hello. All right, before I tell you a story, I have a question for you guys now. Does any of you have friends? Yes. 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 Can you name one of your friends? Uh, yeah. Can anyone name one of their friends? Yeah. Nicholas. Nicholas. That's good. Now, how do you um? Oh, we might hit someone. Now, do you guys like to see your friends all the time? Yes. yes. All right, now, here's the story. There was a young boy, and his name is Rev, and he likes going to school for um, two subjects, only for two subjects, but he goes to all of them. <laughs> now, do you have any favorite subject in school? I like to do um, playtime. Playtime. That's good. <laughs> um. I've, I forgot. <laughs> Fractions and art. Fractions and art. Ooh. Maths. Maths. Oh, wow. Whiz kids. Uh, we can play outside. Yes, we can play outside. Being yeah. in groups. Being groups. Right. Well, you know what? The two subjects that Rev likes is um, recess and lunch. Now, what do you guys do during recess and lunch? Play. Eat. Eat? Yes. So, usually we eat. And of course, for kids, we play. But Rev only plays during lunch. Now, um, you see, Rev is a very odd fellow because he likes recess and lunch, but doesn't eat during those times. However, he eats his recess and lunch during other subjects. Hmm. Now, um, so he uses the time, um, recess and lunch, to start playing with friends like most of you. Now, what's cool, can you listen to your teacher while you're busy with something else? No. 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 Now, who is a very honest kid? Okay. <laughs> Can you come up to here, please? Yes. Oh, don't open it yet. I know. Okay. So can you please give Chocolate. one Chocolate. to everyone? Oh, you can hold the bag. Thank you. Now, now here, we have our friend here giving us chocolates. Now, do you think you're listening to me right now? Yes. Yes? yes. I can see the attention going away. <laughs> now, now, do you think Rev could learn something when he is eating during class? No. No. And what do you think um, when exams comes? Do you think he can answer the questions in the exam? No. No. And do you think he's using his time wisely? No. 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 Now, 
And it's just like the parable of the talents, you know. God gave each of us talents, and it can be time, skill, money, or friends, and different things. And it is our responsibility to make it grow and to use it not just for ourselves, but for others. Now, I gave you everyone one chocolate each, and if you kids can promise me that you will use your time and your ears to listen to Pastor Jared as he teaches us more about the parable of the talents. And if you can show me your chocolate later, um, still wrapped during lunch at the youth room, I may be able to give you another one. <laughs> now our key text is found in Luke chapter 16, verses 10, and it says, he that, he that is faithful in that which is least is also faithful in much. Thank you, kids. Most gracious Father God in heaven, we ask and pray, dear Lord, that you may bless each person here. And we know, dear Heavenly Father, that um, each one has been blessed throughout this week. And that we just pray, dear Lord, that you may continue to, to bless them as they, they give freely from their heart, dear Lord. We ask that you may take what is, what is given, dear Lord, and may it be multiplied and used for your work in the vineyard. We ask these things, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been dreaming of the city Far beyond the sky When the suffering's over Give my wings and fly When Jesus says Sisters, just over the mountains is the promised land, lays the holy city built by God's own hand. And as our weary footsteps gain the mountain tread, we can view our homeland of eternal rest. Now we can see the splendor gleaming from the domes afar. We can see the glory screaming. From the gates ajar, we hear the angels singing, nevermore to roam. We are nearing home, Jerusalem, our home, right up in the sky. I've been dreaming of a city far beyond the sky, when the suffering's over. Good morning, 
morning, everyone. And thank you for that song. It was really beautiful, you know, and it's what we're all waiting for, isn't it? That new Jerusalem, the second coming, heaven and eternity. And I think after this week, it's, it's just a beautiful reminder of what we have to look forward to. We think of the, the shootings at the synagogue in America and you just think, you know, what, ha- what if that happened at our church? It's, it's just shocking what's happened. And this week too, having Halloween, you just kind of, as a Christian, you sit up a bit and you go, what, what's going on with the world, you know? Um, I know some Christians choose to take part in that. For me personally, I just, I, I can't see Jesus ever dressing up in a costume like that or taking part in something like that, you know, coming to earth to defeat Satan and defeat death forever. How could you take it so lightly when you see what it cost Jesus to take death so lightly? Oh, it's just a bit of fun. I don't know. For me personally, I can't see that Jesus would be interested in that, but... Yeah, thank you for the song. Thanks, guys. It's our last sermon today on the Gospel of Matthew. We've been going through the book for the last couple of months, and I've really enjoyed it. You know, the Gospels are always powerful, and seeing Jesus at work, how he's interacting with humanity, I think it's always exciting, and there's always something new to learn when we go through the Gospels. So I've really enjoyed it, and I hope you guys have too. Our last sermon today is on the parable of the talents. Here we go. So if you've got your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 14. And this morning for the sermon, we're going to go through verse by verse, looking at some key words, some key phrases, looking at some of the Greek words too, to see what they mean, to just get a deeper level of understanding of the text. So it's a pretty straightforward sermon today, nothing too fancy. We're just going to work through and see what it means because I think most of us have heard this parable before. It's a very well-known parable. Perhaps if you haven't heard it, then you chose a, a good day to come because this is a really important one that Jesus is telling to us. And you know, it's pretty simple. There's a master and he gives some talents to his servants and two of the servants do a good job. They invest the money Uh, The master's happy with them. One servant uh, doesn't do a whole lot. The master's not very happy with him. The master represents Jesus. The servants represent human beings. And the talents represent skills and abilities that God gives us. The end. We can all go to lunch now. It's a really simple parable. But hopefully as we go through it, We can all learn something new, because I believe we can learn something new. We can discover something new every time we read the Bible. So I'll say a prayer, and then we'll begin. Dear God, we thank you for this day and this opportunity to be here, and we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us in a special way to help us understand Jesus' teaching about these three servants and the talents. In your name, amen. So, start with verse 14. I invite you to follow along in your Bibles. Verse 14 says, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. So, my first question is, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by what? What did the Bible say? By a man. The Greek word is anthropos, and we talked about this a few weeks ago. It means human being, male or female. That's what the word means. If Jesus wanted to refer to an individual male, there was a different Greek word he could have used, but he chose anthropos, and it means male or female. On the surface level... This person is a business owner, isn't he? But on a spiritual level, this person is Jesus. It represents Jesus, who is God. This person goes on a long trip. In English, you kind of just go, "Eh, what does that mean? But in Greek, it means to travel away from home to another country and then return. 
that's the, the deeper meaning of this little phrase here. And I think that's interesting, because in this parable, Jesus is the man, and he's preparing his disciples for his time away. He says he's going away, he's going to heaven, and then he's saying he'll come back, and he'll come home. And I think that's really cool, because Jesus is saying he's coming back to earth, which will be home. He'll recreate it, and he'll live with us forever. I think that's really cool, and I think that's worth remembering. Jesus wants to make his home with humanity. Now, this master, he calls together his servants. Now, the question is, what kind of servants are they? You know, in Greek and Roman times, they had lots of different types of servants. So, the real dumb ones who would perhaps have their tongue cut out so they couldn't speak, or, or they couldn't really do a whole lot. Uh, and then there were the, the really smart servants who were well-educated. We think of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. They were servants, right? But they were incredibly smart and had these high positions within the kingdom. And so there's these different types of servants. And, you know, the question is, what type of servants is Jesus talking about here? I think the fact that the master gives these guys, these servants, these incredibly valuable talents tells us that they're not these really dumb servants, but they're the smarter ones, you know? They're more like employees. They're employees that can't quit because they're still slaves, but they're more like employees. And in Roman times, you could have servants who were tradesmen and artists and farmers and business managers and accountants and chefs. They're still servants, but they held all these high-ranking positions within uh, your household. And so the master trusts them because they are trustworthy. They're capable and they handle these big responsibilities every day. And, and in history, it was not uncommon for a master to do this. When he would leave, he would leave his property, his household, all his belongings in the care of some of his servants. Obviously, when his children would grow up, he'd entrust it to them. But until they grew up, he would entrust it to his servants. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. It's something that the disciples would have known instantly. Um, the listeners of this parable would have understood straight away. The Bible says, Jesus says, he entrusted them with his money while he was gone. So whose money is it? It's a simple point, but it's an important one, that it's the master's money. It's always his. It's never the servant's. It's always his. Then out of verse 15. The Bible says, He gave five talents to one, two talents to another, and one talent to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. And he left on his trip. Now, depending on what Bible you have, it'll use different words here for talents. If you have a KJV or a NKJV or an ESV Bible, they all use the word talents. That's how translators have rendered it into English. And in modern English, a talent refers to a skill or an ability that someone has, doesn't it? That's what we call a talent today. But we can make that analogy with this parable, and that's often how people present this parable. But it's not what Jesus was originally talking about when he's talking about talents. You'll notice that the servants already have abilities. He divided it according to their abilities. So, you know, an ability is not something you can just give someone. You can't just like, oh, it's your birthday, unwrap this present and boo, you can fly a plane now, right? It's, it's not really how you get an ability. You, it's something that you can develop. You can present someone with the opportunity to develop an ability or a skill, but you can't just go, here it is, you know? So it's something different that Jesus is talking about. And in the New Testament times, a talent was a unit of measurement. You would have the scales on both sides, you would put the talent on one side, it was a unit of measurement, then you'd load up whatever else on the other side, so bread or gold or whatever it is, so you can get this this unit. And there would be gold talents and silver talents and copper talents and 
they would all weigh different amounts depending on the type of metal. It would weigh between 26 and 36 kilos, this talent. The, the Greek word for talent in this verse here, it just refers to the generic measurement, the unit of measurement. And so we're unsure what type of metal Jesus is referring to. But if you go to verse 18, the Greek word for money translates to pieces of silver. And so we can see here that Jesus is talking about a, a silver talent. And if you have a New Living Translation Bible, it renders it that way. It says bags of silver. And that's exactly what it was, the bags of silver. If you have a, um, an NIV Bible, it says bags of gold. I'm not sure why it says that. Uh, you might want to make a little note. If you have one of the other Bible translations, you might want to say what a talent is. You could write a little note in there just describing what this is. It's not skills and abilities, it's these big bags of silver. And I looked into what they were. Some Bibles might have a little note down the bottom. I think the NIV just said it's more than $1,000. I don't know how helpful that is, but... One talent, one silver talent, was worth 6,000 denarii, which was their currency, and that would take your average worker 20 years to earn. So if they never paid rent on a house, they never ate food, they never bought clothes, they never spent a single cent, it would take them 20 years to earn this much. And so in Australian money, I did the sums, and if you earn 55000 a year, which is the average wage, then over 20 years, that would equal $1.1 million. That's what a talent is worth in this parable. The first servant, he gets five of these, so he's given $5.5 million. He's given this massive sum of money. The second servant, two bags of silver, 2.2 million, and the last servant is given one, which is worth $1.1 million. And we often feel sorry for this last servant, right? Oh, he only got one talent, that poor servant. He's, only... He's given this whopping great sum of money. I don't know who here in this room would go, oh, no, I don't want a million bucks. No, no, it's fine. It's an incredible gift that the master gives to this servant. And Jesus says it's divided in proportion. The master decides. He makes the decision and the servants don't argue. The master makes the decision because he knows his servants. He knows what they're capable of achieving. He knows how to challenge them so that they can reach their full potential. So that's why he makes the decision. And so a lesson that I think that we can learn from this is that when Jesus makes a decision in our lives, a calling on our lives to do something, he knows that we can do it. He doesn't set us some unachievable goal that we'll never be able to reach. He goes, I know you, and I know that you can do this. There's no point complaining or arguing with God, these servants don't do it, but just to trust that he knows what's best for us. And the master divides it according to their abilities. Obviously, they already had abilities, like I said before, and, and now they're given a gift. How does the master know what each person's ability is? He, he spends time with them. It's what we all need to do. If we want to know someone, understand them, see what they're good at, we need to spend time with them. And the Master does that with them. The Greek word here describing abilities describes, it's really interesting, it describes the power and strength to achieve by applying God's ability. It's not us, it's God's ability. It's needed in every area of life to grow closer to Jesus and prepare for heaven. That's what this word means. That's why Jesus chose it. It's not about us and what we can do. It's applying God's ability in our lives to grow closer to Jesus and prepare for heaven. I think that's kind of cool when you realize that. It says he left on his trip. The master never asked the servants to invest the money. Sometimes we, do, we miss that, but he never asked them. He never told them what to do. He just... He expected them to know what to do. And so a lesson for this one, I think, as we're stepping through verse by verse, a lesson is that 
Sometimes God doesn't tell us what to do in life. We pray and we pray and he doesn't give us an answer. And it is the most frustrating thing, right? You go, hey God, we're Christians, we're Adventists, we read the Bible, we pray. Why don't you tell me what to do? I'm sure we have all had experiences like, just tell me, God, I honestly want to know. Why can't you just tell me? But I think deep down we all know what to do. In some form or another, the Holy Spirit works on our hearts. We do know what to do. We do know what is right and wrong deep down if we listen to God's voice. Next verses. The servant who received the five bags of silver, began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. And so what did they do? You can say it if you know. They invested the money. The Greek word for invest means, obviously, investing, trading, doing business, buying and selling. It is the complete opposite of being idle and doing nothing. That's what this word means. And as a result of their investing, first servant earned five more and the other servant earned two more. The Greek word here for earn means to trade and profit while avoiding losses. So these are not dumb servants. They're clever, they're intelligent, they know how to invest, they know how to work with money, they know how to make good business decisions. They are careful, clever investors. And they go and do it straight away. They don't wait, oh, Master's coming back tomorrow, I better do something, you know? Oh, Jesus is coming back tomorrow, I better look busy. Like, these guys go and get to work straight away. They know the Master's coming back, and they get to work straight away. And over the years, they double their original investment, which is what we all want to do, right? As investors, everyone wants to double their money. Verse 18... But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Why would he do that? Why would you dig a hole in the ground and and bury money? Seems like a pirate, doesn't it, you know? Dig a hole, chuck your treasure in there. Back in New Testament times, this is something that people would do. It was the safest way to hide your money. People come, ransack your house, kill everyone and take your money. But if you buried it in the ground, people couldn't find it. You remember in Matthew 13, there's a man, he buys a field and it has a hidden treasure in it. In the Old Testament, there's this guy uh, in Joshua 7 called Achan and he, he buries this stolen treasure in his tent. He's essentially robbing God in that story. And as a result, as a punishment, he's stoned to death and then he's burned. That's what happens to that guy. It was the safest way to hide your money back in those times. You know, you would take three steps to the left from this tree and then four steps down this way and you'd dig your hole, you'd bury your treasure so no one could find it. The problem was that you can't earn anything with your money. It's not going to increase in value. You rely on inflation, really. That's about it. It's not an active investment. You can't earn anything from it. But that's what this servant does with his money. And then verse 19. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. Why did the master take a long time to return. Is it just part of the story? Is it just Jesus telling a story? Oh, well, a long time, short time, I'll choose. Why would Jesus say this? Yeah. He's trying to tell his disciples that his second coming is not going to be for a long time. They're all expecting Jesus to set up his kingdom right here and there, or maybe if he has to go away, he'll be back in a jiffy, you know, he'll be back in their lifetime, he'll be back real quick. But he's trying to tell them, no, 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 this this second coming is not going to happen as quickly as you think. This is what the parable of the ten virgins was about. The bridegroom tarries, right? He is delayed. He's not as quick coming back as they expected. And Jesus doesn't tell them how much of a delay it will be. 
other than in, in the Gospel of Matthew, he says five times, no one knows the day or the hour, no one knows when I'm coming back. He says that five times, and yet you look throughout history, I mean, how many people have tried to predict when Jesus would return? You, you just Google it for one second and you find all these graphs and charts where they've nutted out every single tiny little thing and, oh, Jesus is coming in March 2019, get ready. Or, there's all these charts and throughout history, you know, Adventists kind of started out of something like that in 1844 where these guys put a date, Jesus is coming, October 22, 1844. And you kind of wonder how they missed this in the Gospel of Matthew where five times Jesus repeats it. You think if Jesus says something once, it should be enough. But he says this five times. No one knows the day or the hour. No one knows when I'm returning. And if for some reason we miss it, that's what Jesus is saying. And so the lesson, I think, from this part is that we need to use this time that God's given us. We don't know when it will end, but to use the time God's given us to to use the gifts that he entrusts us with to, to spread the gospel and enlarge the kingdom. That's what we have this time for. Yeah, they're the verses if you want to check them out afterwards. Despite being gone for a long time, notice Jesus says, it's, it's still the master's money. Servants never tried to claim it as their own. They didn't chuck it in their back pocket and run off. They, they still acknowledge that it's his money. And I think the lesson from this part is that God doesn't give us gifts that become totally ours. We can't consume them and say, yes, it is mine, it is mine, it's my precious, you know. It, it doesn't become ours. God entrusts us with gifts. And one day he'll ask us to give an account of what we have done with the gift that he's given us. This is what the parable that Zenny talked about last week, the sheep and the goats, that's what it's all about. What have we done with the gifts that God has given us? In verse 20, Jesus says, the servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and see, I have earned five more. There's something to learn in every verse, and what stood out to me in this one is that he says, see. The result is real, it is tangible, you can see it, it's visible. You can't spiritualize it away, it's a real tangible thing that has resulted from this gift that he's been given. In the next verse, the master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Enter into the joy of your master. So how does the master describe the servant? He uses two words. Please say it if you know it. Good and faithful. Excellent. Good and faithful. And Greek word here for faithful refers to someone being reliable and trustworthy and loyal. And if you were here uh, last Wednesday night when I was presenting on Revelation 14, loyalty is a massive deal at the end of time. It's what Revelation 14 is all about. It's being loyal to Jesus. Throughout your life, there are ups and downs and ups and downs, and hopefully the trajectory is going up, right? You still never reach where we're, we're perfect, but we're going up and down, up and down, hopefully upwards. But what truly matters is loyalty. It's loyalty to Jesus. You can make mistakes. You can be in a relationship with your husband or wife or, or a friend, and you can make mistakes. You can hurt them. You can say something wrong. You can do something wrong, but you can remain loyal, and they forgive you, and you move on. And loyalty is the message of the Bible, I think. Certainly at the end of time, it's loyalty to God, loyalty to Jesus, loyalty to his teachings, loyalty to his commandments. That's what it's all about. And that's what this word faithful here means. You're being loyal. 
And he says, you've been loyal, you've been faithful in a small amount. And I don't know, we kind of skip over this, perhaps. I don't know how the disciples originally reacted to it, but how is it a small amount? To one bloke, he gives five and a half million dollars. To another guy, 2.2. Another guy, 1.1. Oh, it's a small amount. How rich is this guy? In the Greek, it really emphasizes it's an insubstantial amount. It's so small, it's worth nothing compared to the wealth of the master. When you think about who this master is, that it's Jesus, that it's God, it's the creator of the universe, you think about what he has to give, the incredible gifts of heaven that he has to share, it really is a small amount that he gives with us. And he says, I've got many more responsibilities to give to you. So many more gifts. He doesn't say abilities and skills. He says responsibilities. And I think it's a key difference. The master's gifts are responsibilities. He then says, enter into the joy of your master. And this one I found really, really interesting. When I found the, the Greek meaning for this one, Joy means joy because of grace. It's not just happiness, you know, dance around with flowers, and it, it's joy because of grace. I think that's the type of joy we should have as Christians. Not just, oh, well, Jesus loves me, I'll be happy, but Jesus loves me, look what he did for me, look at the incredible grace he has shown me, and that's why I'm happy. It's joy because of grace. True joy comes when we embrace the grace of our Master. The next verse is 22 to 23. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and see, I have earned two more. The Master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Enter into the joy of your master. The master gives this same joyful response as he did to the first servant. And Jesus takes the time to repeat it all the way through. He had a different amount. He had two talents instead of five. It's three million dollars less. But the reward that he has given is absolutely equal to the first servant. So the lesson from this verse is that quantity is not important, right? Quantity is not important. What's important is how you use the gifts that God gives you. And for all of us, it is in many ways the same, but in many ways it's slightly different. There's the gift of forgiveness. And you think about how many times God forgives us forgives you. And perhaps that's different to the person sitting beside you, but it's a gift. We think about the gift of freedom that God gives us. You know, do we use that? Do we accept that? Or do we just abuse this gift of freedom that God has given every single one of us? The gift of mercy and grace and the gift of salvation, you know? Can you put a dollar figure on the gift of salvation? This incredible gift that God has given to every single one of us. What's important is how we use these gifts that God has given us. What do we do with that freedom? What do we do with that grace? What do we do with that mercy, that forgiveness, with that salvation that is on offer to every single one of us? What do we do? Just, oh, well, it's nice. Now I'll come and sit in church. And, oh, yeah, I'll sing a few songs. And, oh, yeah, I'll go to an Adventist school and blah, blah. What do we do with this salvation that God is offering to us? Does it make all the difference? If it's only a proportional difference, then what's it really worth? It has to make all the difference in every area of your life. Notice that while the servants were good and faithful and still generated these massive financial returns, they still remained servants. You think, surely, if they were ever going to be set free, this is the time they'll be set free when they've done so much for the Master, right? 
But I think Jesus is trying to teach us a lesson here because even in heaven, when we go one day into all eternity, in some way we will still be a servant of Christ. We will still serve Jesus for all eternity. We don't get to heaven and go, woo, yeah, I'm out of here, see you, God. It's like, no, 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 we will still serve Jesus for all eternity. And Jesus is, is teaching this here. Verse 24. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I know you are a hard man, harvesting crops where you have not sown and gathering crops where you did not cultivate. He describes his master as a hard man. He claims, he makes this claim that his master is exploiting the work of others, harvesting where you have not sown, he says. And the servant claims that because he is a hard master, he didn't know what to do with the talent that he was given, that he was afraid of failing in case the master got angry and upset at him. And so, oh, that's, that's why he did nothing, you know? Perhaps on some level, he was a bit jealous of the other servants who received more talents than him. And so, this is his way of revenge, you know? It's an act of spite, of not doing anything with the talent that he's given. Perhaps that was his thinking. Perhaps he was annoyed that they'd been shown mercy and forgiveness more than him. Perhaps we do that sometimes too. Oh, they've sinned so many times, they've done so, and yet how can they still call themselves a Christian? How can... The Gospel says all can be forgiven, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done. Think of the thief on the cross often when it comes to forgiveness. And you, sometimes you go, well, he waited till the very last moment, then he was forgiven, and then he's saved. Another way to look at it is that he took the very first opportunity he had to be saved. I think that's what we should be doing too. We, we notice in this parable, only the wicked servant blames his master The faithful servants, they never complain about these massive responsibilities that the master gives to them, right? What if the boss came to you Monday morning at work and wrote, here's five and a half million dollars, go and double it for me. Like, uh, how? how?" It's a huge thing that he's giving to these guys, but they never complain. They're faithful, they work hard, and they do their best. When we think back to the ten virgins, the The foolish virgins failed from thinking that their job was too easy. The wicked servant failed from thinking his job was too hard. There's these warnings in both parables that Jesus is giving to us. So the lesson in this one is that the grace and the love and the mercy of God is never an excuse for being irresponsible with the gifts that he gives us. We are all called to be faithful with what God gives us, whatever that may be in in your life. The servant says, I was afraid, and so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. We've heard this phrase before, haven't we? We've read something very, very similar in the Bible, right back in the beginning. In Genesis 3, God calls to Adam and he says, Where are you? I heard your voice in the garden, he replies, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Jesus is echoing back here to Genesis. And did Adam and Eve have any reason to fear God? None, did they? They had no reason to fear God, but their disobedience and sin had resulted in their fear. And so they go out and hide in nature. They're trying to hide from God in nature. And did the servant in this parable have any reason to fear his master? None, did he? The master clearly had confidence in him, entrusting him with this massive amount of money, but his disobedience resulted in his fear. And so he goes and hides the money in the earth, in nature. This is so similar to what Adam and Eve did. And Jesus makes this link back to the fall of humanity on purpose. He wants us to know that the sin of the servant was the same as Adam and Eve's 
sin. You see, both were given a huge gift. Both knew what was expected of them. Both failed to listen to their master. And both were cast out of the garden and of the kingdom. It's the exact same thing that happened. It's this warning again. Jesus is saying, don't do it. Don't miss out on eternity. Notice again that the servant still recognises that the money belongs to his master. He knows it has never, ever been his. The lesson for us is, do we recognise that in our own lives? That everything we have belongs to God. Our life, our family, our friends, the clothes that we wear, the house that we live in, the air that we breathe, that nothing could exist without God, that he gives us everything. People say this all the time. Christians say it all the time. Preachers say, everything you have comes from God. But do we actually internalize that? What does that mean? Perhaps I'll care for my things a little bit better. Perhaps I'll invest my time and effort a little bit better. Perhaps I'll treat others a little bit better, knowing that they're a gift of God too. Everything is a gift from God. The next verses, the master replies, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have received some interest on it. It's pretty harsh what the master calls this servant, right? Wicked and lazy. The boss ever calls you into his office and goes, right, you're wicked and lazy. You're like, well, well, I'm fired, but that's it. That's what he calls this servant. And if this master is representing Jesus, calling someone wicked and lazy, that's a huge statement that he's making. The Greek word for wicked means evil and bad and malicious. It, it emphasizes the inevitable misery that always goes with evil. There's never anything good about evil. And the Greek word for lazy, it just means lazy. So, wicked and lazy. And he says, why didn't you go and put my money in the bank? It's a real practical teaching, isn't it? Jesus understood the culture that he lived in. It's not some crazy spiritual... It's just, why didn't you do it? Practical teaching and... Some people are are sceptical about investing money, but Jesus is saying, just, this is the least you could have done, servant. That's what the master is saying. It's the least you should have done. In the Roman Empire, you could invest your money. They had banks, you could invest your money and earn interest. I did a bit of research, and the, the maximum interest rate that a bank could charge a borrower was 12%. That's the level that the empire set. The people investing their money could earn 6% in return and the banks would take the other 6%. So they took half. But that's just how it worked back then. And so, in verse 19, we read that the master was gone for a long time. And we don't know how many years, but it's a long time. And I did the sums on this one too. If you have $1.1 million, you invested at 6% over 12 years, you double your investment. So if this servant had simply put his money in the bank for 12 years, he would have doubled his investment doing absolutely nothing. But clearly, he didn't do that either. And so he's lazy. He's wicked for not doing what he should have and lazy for just being a total bludger. Verse 28, the master ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. Notice here that the master gives the orders. No one questions the master's orders, not even the wicked servant. He doesn't come up with a thousand reasons why, no, 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 that's not okay. He knows that this judgment on him is fair. And at the end of time, when when Christ gives the order, those who are saved, those who are lost, those who are righteous, those who are unrighteous, those who are sheep, those who are goats, those who are the wise builder, those who are the foolish builder, those who took the straight and narrow way, those who took the wide way. When Christ gives that dividing, when he gives that order, everyone will know that that judgment is fair. They'll see back in their life, they'll know 
that Jesus' judgment is fair. Verse 29, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Those who are faithful with what God gives will be given even more. If this is not a reason to be faithful, I don't know what is. Jesus is promising to bless you when you're faithful. And notice that they don't earn it for themselves. It's not something they give themselves. Every time it's given to them, and it's given to them as a gift, it never belongs to them. It's given as a gift. And what about those who do nothing? What, what happens? Jesus is saying that everything they have will be taken away. can't just do what you want. Oh, God, yeah, just, no, please, please. Oh, okay, here's some little... Everything they have is taken away. They can't keep it even if they try because it was never theirs in the first place. That's what this story, this parable is teaching. Verse 30, now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word for useless means unprofitable and unworthy. He's unworthy of the gift the Master gave him. Throw him out into darkness. This is a big theme in the Bible, light versus darkness. And this particular word that Jesus uses refers to the unavoidable results of sin. He's brought it upon himself. The word for weeping refers to bitter grief that results from feeling utterly hopeless usually brought on by uncontrollable emotional, psychological pain. That's what weeping is. It's not, oh, boo-hoo, here's a tear. It's uncontrollable emotional pain. And then gnashing of teeth, these final words. It's a metaphor for deep distress and remorse. And that's how the parable ends. Jesus doesn't give us an explanation like he did with the wheat and the tares. He doesn't say, here's what all the symbols mean. He simply ends here in verse 30 saying, weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's kind of an abrupt ending and it's designed to shake us up and wake us up to the reality of what it is to follow Jesus or not. And so since Jesus ends it this way, I'm going to end it this way too. I'm not going to give some airy, fairy, fantastical idea. That's how Jesus ends it. And hopefully through going through verse by verse and phrase by phrase, it's been like a a rosebud blooming, right? Hopefully looking at some of these words, you can get a, a deeper understanding of what they mean. And we'll spend a few minutes now before the worship team come up. And I have these questions and I want you to talk with the person beside you just for a couple of minutes on these questions from the parable today. What was new? What did you discover? Hopefully there was something new that we could all learn today. How does Jesus' parable challenge you? If you read the Bible and you leave being the same person, what's it worth? Every teaching of Jesus challenges us and then how will you apply Jesus' teaching to your life? The questions we could ponder for a long time, but I'll give you guys a few minutes now just to think about this and discuss it with the person beside you. Okay, well, we'll wrap things up. There's so much to talk about and I invite you to hang around after the service and continue these discussions on what this parable means to us. Um, Yeah, will we finish with a song? Okay, come on up. We'll do the song, and then I'll close with a prayer. I'll close with prayer. Um, And if you'd like to talk with me after, I'll be up the front if I can pray for you or you have a question for me. Um, You're welcome to hang around and chat. We also have the soup and buns. You're all most welcome to stay for that too. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for Sabbath. We thank you for Jesus' parable of the talents. And thank you that there's so much to learn in every verse, in every word as we go through. It's the, the master 
mastery of Jesus' teaching. Um, please give us uh, the courage to read our Bibles, God. Sometimes it's hard. Please give us the courage and give us the, the courage and the ability to share what we learn with others in our family, with our friends, with those at work, who, whoever you bring into our lives, God, and please help us to share the, the good news that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen.